Yeah, that's good. Cool. Welcome today to this at a distance worship on this Palm Passion Sunday in April of 2020. As we worship together, let us give thanks for all God has done for us and seek God's wisdom for the future. Let us worship God together. We begin the holiest of weeks this day seeking to discover God in the passion and grief. And grace on us, O God, as we listen for the words which will sustain our weariness of the days through which we are living. We will be invited to sit at the table where Jesus welcomes friends and followers. And grace on us, brother of our tears, as we struggle not to turn our backs on you in these days through which we are living, but find ourselves welcome at the table of grace. As the days unfold, may we worry not so much about ourselves, but for the one who stands by us. Have grace on us, spirit of comfort, and hold us in every moment of this journey through the days in which we are living. Shall we sing the uh, first and fourth verses, that's all you have at home, of They'll Know We Are Christians. come to God with open hearts and honest words, we will not be pushed away, but wrapped in God's loving and forgiving embrace. I invite you to join me as we confess our lives together to God, praying first in silence and then all together. 
Let us pray. And now together, loving God, in the midst of energy and parades, the laughter of children, and the beautiful chaos of procession, we pause. We pause to remember that going up to Jerusalem cost Jesus his very life. So we come before you to confess. We confess that the ways that religious words and holy phrases so easily from our lips, yet fall flat in our lives. We confess that our faith can be shallow and our following can be timid. Forgive us. Forgive us and set us free to see the ways your Spirit is active within us and among us. Open us once more to do your faithfulness and your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God is our help, so why should we be afraid? God is keeping us safe. There is nothing to dread. This is the good news for all of us. Sheltered in God's gracious heart of mercy and love, we raise shouts of joy. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? When we are so weary, we cannot seem to put one foot in front of the other. You take us by the hand. For you, God, are steadfast love. You join us on morning walks and in quiet evenings. When we long to run away from all the worries, the fears, the difficulties we face, be the peace our weary souls need. You are a word of hope for us all. Teach us how to listen for your voice. Steadfast love, word of hope, spirit of peace, speak to us now, for we are listening. Amen. Amen. So the scripture reading for today comes from John's Gospel, reading from chapter 13. We're reading verses 1 to 17, and this is part of a, an extended version of John's uh, last evening, telling of Jesus' last evening with his disciples. So listen now for what the Spirit speaks to your life today. Now before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come and to depart from this world and to go to his Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will, you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share in me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands, my head. And Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and then put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, 
Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have sent for you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. And if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This ends the reading for today. May God bless your understanding and build up our faith through it. And to God be all praise and glory, now and forever. So let me begin by saying that I'm not really sure how I feel about this whole section in the Gospel of John. I mean, this wish washing and then the supper and Jesus giving the disciples a new commandment, that they love one another the way that he has loved them. Then this prayer that comes that is way too long. I'm sure that's where ministers got the idea it was okay to pray on and on during worship services. But, you know, as I thought about this passage and I dug deeper into it this week and you and I have had more than enough time to dig deep into things, right? Uh, anyway, I realize I'm uncomfortable with this passage because the whole section is filled with vulnerability, intensity, intimacy. There's this poignant love that's being expressed here by Jesus toward his followers, toward those folks who have wandered around the countryside with him for the last three years. And Jesus is trying to comfort these disciples, to fill them with strength and to help them as they go through the trauma of what's about to come. In all the Gospel accounts uh, of Jesus last night, he sits down to a meal with his disciples, as he does here. And it's an important part of the story, I think. It's a story, it's a part of the story that we tell every year on this week. And it's the beginning of a beautiful practice of communion, which we will share in a little bit. Jesus breaks bread, shares it with everyone present, even his betrayer. But it's only in the Gospel according to John that this foot washing scene takes place. These chapters are some called Jesus' Farewell Discourse. And the discourse goes on for five chapters. In Mark's Gospel, this last evening that Jesus has with his disciples only lasts uh, a mere nine verses. Check it out, Mark 14, 17 to 25. But in John, we have five chapters. Chapters 13 to 17. Jesus is saying goodbye, and he says it with many words, repeated over and over and over again. Things like, do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I will not leave you orphaned. I am going soon, but an advocate will come and the Spirit will be with you forever and will continue to teach you and remind you what I have taught already. And things like, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in that love. And because all the disciples know that Jesus is about to die, it's all such mo so much more intense, I think. The repetition only increases that intensity. In a hundred different ways, Jesus tells the disciples, don't be afraid. I love you. I always have. I will always be with you. It's not over. And Jesus is saying goodbye, but it's not just with words. He's also saying goodbye with his actions. He's taking a dramatic step when he takes on the role of a servant and washes the feet of his disciples. He steps into this vulnerable role, places his humanity right there next to the humanity of his disciples, and through this very intimate act, he affirms their connection to one another. 
He's teaching, modeling humility and compassion in the way that he washes their feet. And he is persistent in his love for them. Even when Peter doesn't understand what he's doing and tries to turn Jesus away, saying, Ooh, not my feet, man. I have stinky feet. To which Jesus responds, Hey, this is our connection. This is how you have become a part of me. Let me wash you. So try to imagine them on this night, gathered in this upper room. Jesus telling them he will die. He's their dear beloved. He has been their guide. He has charged and changed their lives. And now they're filled with fear and grief as to what's about to come. Because they don't want to lose him. They don't want the truth to be the truth. They don't want the situation to be the situation. According to John's Gospel, Jesus brought the creative power of God into the world. Remember how we've talked about, you know, how this Gospel begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything came into being through Him. That's Jesus and John. The source of all things. Powerful and in control. Creative. Loving. The Word made flesh, John says. And yet, Jesus reflects this incredible vulnerability in the flesh, in being human, weeping in grief for his friend Lazarus, who dies, and for Lazarus' sisters. Facing his own death, too, he is perhaps weeping. It takes a lot of strength to be vulnerable. And that might seem like a contradiction, but it's one of the main teachings that Jesus offers us. Strength and vulnerability are deeply intertwined. Being strong enough to be vulnerable ourselves is what allows us to be connected to each other, to God. Now, Dr. Brene Brown has gotten a lot of attention lately. I don't know if you saw the 60 Minutes piece or have seen that she started a a new uh, podcast which immediately went to be to become the number one podcast on the internet most subscribed to and Brene is a research professor at the University of Houston she has spent the past several 15 years at least studying vulnerability and courage worthiness and shame and what she talks about is very much the human connection our ability to empathize with one another to belong to each other, to, to love. And she says this, connection is why we are here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. I think Jesus models that in washing the disciples' feet. We humans long for connection, and that longing is so clear to us now that we don't have face-to-face -face connection in the same way. But it gives us purpose and meaning to our lives, says Brown. The proof is evidenced by the fact that, you know, in uh, 2010 she did a TED Talk. And uh, it was called The Power of Vulnerability. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's one of the top ten most viewed talks on TED.com. And it's been watched over 45 and a half million times by people. A few years ago, I think two or three years ago, when I first last checked, it had only been 28 million times. And I'm sure that it keeps rising by the day. And I think it's because people want and need to hear this message. That vulnerability has its own kind of power. One of Dr. Brown's books is called Daring Greatly. How courage to be vulnerable transforms the way that we live, love, parent, and lead. And our cohort groups that the Presbytery has been involved in, that I've been involved with, uh, has read this book, and it's so powerful. She says that we have to dare greatly to be vulnerable. And counterintuitively, when we are vulnerable, is when we become brave. 
She says, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Vulnerability sounds like truth because we tell the truth and we have to show our imperfections, our weaknesses, our doubts. First, we have to admit them to ourselves, which is not an easy thing, and then we allow other people to see them. Vulnerability sounds like truth, like being real. And it feels like courage because it's hard to be authentic. It's frightening. You know, doing this thing here is, is awkward. Preaching to a semi-empty sanctuary is just, it is not me. But this is what she also goes on to say. Vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable. But they're never weakness. So can we be brave enough, vulnerable enough, to let Jesus wash us? To allow Jesus to cleanse us, to connect to us in an intimate way? gracious way? Can we take down our shields, take out our auto cloaks and let God see us and wash us clean to relieve us of the burdens that we're carrying? It's not that God can't already truly see us. I mean, think about Adam and Eve fighting in the garden, really. You think God had to say, where are you? No, he was giving them an opportunity to connect again even after they've done what God had asked them not to. And our vulnerabilities are an essential part of what it means to be human. Our culture tends to want us to cover all those things up, to act like everything is fine and that we are great. I mean, how many times when somebody asks you the last tough couple of weeks, asks you how you are, you say, no, I'm okay. Or do you talk about those things that are wrestling inside of you, those fears that you have, the worry or the confusion and the doubts. Can we be brave enough to allow that kind of vulnerability so that we can be so much stronger in the long run, more deeply connected to ourselves and to each other? Dr. Brown says that vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. It's the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. If we want greater clarity in our purpose or deeper and more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. And we certainly know that today, don't we? So, I'm going to invite you this morning as uh, we gather together virtually. I'm going to invite you to do uh, this exercise before we celebrate communion. And it's, uh, it's an exercise that comes from an old Quaker tradition. And it's known as palms down and palms up. So what I want you to do right now at home is to get into a comfortable place. And uh, you can place your hands in front of you or on uh, the chair next to you or on your lap, whatever feels best. And I want you to begin to imagine the worries that you have, your fears, all the anger or the tension or the pain that you're feeling because of this sheltering in place. Everything and anything that has become a burden to you. And I want you to begin to imagine uh, it flowing out of your hands with your hands palm down. You're releasing those things. Giving it to God. Allowing Jesus to wash you clean. You might imagine that Jesus is standing or sitting in front of you and you're pouring all this out at his feet. All those things that concern you so that it seeps down into the ground, flowing all away from you. 
And I want you to, we're going to give you a couple of minutes. I'd ask you to pause the video uh, after I finish explaining. Take as long as you need to name those things that I've just mentioned. And to let it wash thoroughly, thoroughly through you, letting it go. And listen to the voice of Jesus that says, don't be afraid. I love you. I am with you. It is not over. And then when you're ready, at a certain point, turn your palms up as a sign that you're open to receive the light and the love of God. Let all of that pour into you through the palms of your hands and through the top of your head. You might see and feel the light beginning to surround you on all sides and hold you, embrace you, fill you. And as the light comes through your palms, you might feel yourself to begin to be full. And light may shine back out of you again. This happens. Let that light shine as best you can. Let it in and let it shine out. So I invite you now to take a few moments of silence, however long you need, pause the video, and then come back when you're ready, as you've released and received. Amen. So if you haven't already, uh, pause again and go get your uh, cracker of bread and a uh, small cup of juice so that we can celebrate communion together. And join me now in the liturgy that has been sent out to you. May the God who gives us everything we need be with you. May God, God be with you so you, so you lack, lack nothing. nothing. Let, let us empty ourselves of the shadows within. May, May God, God fill our empty, empty hearts, hearts with the light of love. Trust in God in these moments. For God is with us we come to the one who saves us with love. You sifted chaos, God, of every moment, and creation was formed from the emptiness. Mornings which break bright and clear, gentle breezes that herald spring, soft rain which nourishes new life. We were shaped in your image, and you longed to serve us with your love. But we wanted more than what you offered and turn from your open arms. Time and again you sent prophets, women and men who sought to heal our grief with words of hope, to wipe the tears from our cheeks, but we refused, did not listen to them. And then you chose to send your child, the one who would not let his faith fail him, but would follow you all the way to death. And with those who desire to feast with you, we offer our thanksgiving to you. Holy, 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 holy are you, God, 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 whose heart aches with grief. All of creation mingles its tears with yours this week. Have, Have grace on all to journey in the coming days. Blessed is the one who stands by you. Have grace on all who seek to find peace in the coming days. Daring to imagine new life for your children, God of holiness and hope, Jesus became one of us, made in your image. He chooses to greet us with open arms. He remembers us in death and in life. He chose to endure the passion, betrayed into death's hands, and then you raised him to new life, giving new hope to us all. And so we pro proclaim this mystery called faith. In, in every moment, moment Jesus knew that you were with him. In the in moment of death, Jesus committed himself to you. In the moment of resurrection, you committed yourself to him. And in the moments to come, you will commit yourself to us. It is here at this table that we gather, where our, our tears will be wiped, our brokenness made whole, our weariness transformed into service as you pour the gift of your Spirit upon us and on these gifts of this feast. 
This bread becomes strength, which fills our emptiness. This cup, which overflows with grace, becomes the nourishment we need. And so we join our voices praying the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, our Father and Mother, who, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread. And, and forgive us our sins, as, as we forgive those who sin against us. us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As on his last night with his disciples, Jesus took bread and after having given thanks, as we have given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and saying, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And so I invite all of us who are gathered here today to take the bread and let's take it as one. Bread of life, given to us by our brother Jesus. And after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant which I make in my blood. All of you drink from it in remembrance of me. This is the love of God, poured out for us, intended to connect us to God and to our best selves and to one another. As we drink this, let us drink it with thanksgiving. Please take your cups. And let us drink together. Shall we pray together the prayer after communion? Lord, Lord of yesterday, today, today and, and tomorrow, tomorrow gather here as we are able, with a mixture of hope and anticipation, fear, excitement, and expectation. We do not know what the days ahead hold for us. There are things we are afraid of and worries that distract us. Whatever, Whatever the future brings to us, we trust you and we place every day in your care, knowing that, as, as in the past, you are with us, caring for us with constant love. Amen. Amen. And now will you prepare yourselves to sing the servant song? Shall we sing together the servant song?